Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Welcome back. To the Us Three podcast. I would say another episode, was, but it's been a while. Yeah, I was looking back on um, I was looking back on the one we did a couple of weeks ago, like literally a month ago, and we were like, yes, the Us Three podcast is back. back. And well, then we didn't do it for well, the last month. one was the Christmas one. Well we did it in the furnace. And as you can tell, we're not in the furnace right now. Uh, mm. we're actually coming to you live from our uni kitchen. We're going back to our roots slightly on this I, one. Well we did a well, we are gonna have another episode where we Basically back Tom, we thought year, that you so. wasn't worth like going to a massive like lovely posh restaurant for and we thought we'd just chuck you in our kitchen on the TV. That's that's that yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm I quite like the fact that you brought me right back to the roots where it all began. I yeah. feel like <laughs> the epicenter of the Us Three podcast. Very happy for that. No, exactly. yeah, I mean exactly. you, you know no pressure, but you know you're you're the person who's going to reboot it. You know, so you know you've really got to deliver it. Well, it's probably best to explain yeah, who, that, who person that person is to reboot <laughs> it. Is comedian Tom Horton. Tom, how are you doing today, mate? I'm very good, thank you very much. I'm on the road, so I'm currently in a hotel room. Um, just eating the biscuits and drinking lots of coffee. Is I mean, it? Is, that, is it? A, what? What hotel is it? What hotel are you in? It's the Borough Hotel in Lancaster. I did a show at the Grand Theatre in Lancaster. Then I'm going to Barrow and Furness tonight, and then I'm back to Manchester for three nights. Very nice. And then back to London. I guess it's worth saying. Are tickets still on sale? Can people still buy uh, tickets for the for the shows if you want to promo it now? Well, it's not my show, so if you're going to buy a ticket, buy it, don't buy it to any of these shows I'm doing now. I'm, I'm, support, I'm supporting Milton Jones, and he doesn't need the money, he's fine. So, I do, so wait until next month, then I'm on tour. Thank you. Yeah, a plug straight away. Well, nice. 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 You, you can leave now. You can you can leave the Zoom now. Your time's <laughs> you've got what you wanted out of this. You're fine now. You're done. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> it's uh, Tom. Quick question um, about like on the topic of hotels. Uh, what is like your favourite hotel? Like you know, if you've got like because obviously you know with your background and stuff like that, living in the Tower of London. But are you Premier in Holiday in or you, you know do you, do you stay in those? Do you know what? Um, Premier Rooms are actually quite good. I'm pretty yeah. happy with the Premier Room. Yeah, they are the best. And um, I've got, I've also, I've got, a, I've got a German girlfriend who lives in Munich. Mm-hmm. And so when she comes over, oh, she knows when when you fly, you always get a a flight early in the morning because it's the cheapest when she flies yeah. the cheapest. Yeah. But rather than wake up and have to drive to the airport, we always book a Premier Inn the night before, right, so nice. right next to the airport. And uh, I know how to treat a lady, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she just she just got off a flight two hours and expecting this really lovely hotel rock up Premier Inn. The thing is, I'd rather that to a travel lodge. Rather that to a travel lodge. I mean, Premier Inn. Yeah, is Premier Inn's are better. Than Premier Inn's the perfect, lodges. perfect price. What, you what get? was the one that we stayed in travel in um, Thingamajig before? Lodge in we had no, we had before the holiday. We were in was it Hilden? No, Hilton. Was it? Was it yeah, and it, instead of like you know like a, a lady Tom, you know like a beautiful German girl, it was just me and John that stayed in the same same yeah, same bed together. You know, <laughs> same bed. I was I ended up I ended up on the floor. We thought we both had <laughs> single gonna, beds. I was and I still on the floor. I'm interested to know which of you two would be the big spoon and which would be the little spoon yeah. in that relationship. <laughs> we could try it out to be fair. You know, we, we can, can lie down on the sofa yeah. and we can give it a go. Um, <laughs> I'm little spoon. Anyway, no, yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah, Josh just got some serious Little Spoon vibes for me. Oh, wow, 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 wow. No, no, there's nothing... nothing very... Tom, if you're on the Premier Inn, right, are you Little Spoon with your girlfriend? I love being Little Spoon. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with being a Little Spoon. Little I can spoon back that. Please don't take that as insult at all. It's <laughs> nice having a little human backpack on you. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you with me. It is. Everyone loves... If you go to someone and you're like... Um, if you go and like, oh, what do you prefer? And they say being the Big Spoon, they're lying to you, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they're, you, yeah. Everyone loves being yeah. the Little Spoon. Absolutely, I agree. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll dive straight into yeah. this podcast then. Um, Tom, we're going to start. We'd like to do like this thing with our guests. And what would you... like? A life is a movie, right? So if, if you were to, so far to this point, you were to put your life as a movie, we'll start off. What like genre would it be? You know, comedy, drama? What would it be? You know what? I think, I think it's a movie that's definitely written by Richard Curtis. Okay. <laughs> it's definitely like a, like Love Actually, uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral. I'm essentially like Hugh Grant. Oh wow! <laughs> so I think is I that who you? Is that who you get to play you, Tom? I love Hugh Grant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hugh Grant did hey there to play me. Yeah, it was great. It was. It's fair. He's had some good films. He's, as Hugh Grant. He's fallen off a little bit though. Do you mm. not think? I couldn't tell you. 
I think he's on a comeback. I think he 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 was like the king of the '90s rom-com. Yeah. And then he did some questionable thing with some questionable women in New York. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that scandal. Yeah. Um. After like he cheated on Liz Hurley. Why would you do that? Um, <laughs> it's, no, it's it's a very good point. It's like you've got Liz Hurley there, but then you cheat on her. It's like just be happy with like oh. this is the pinnacle, right? Isn't it? Yeah. With a, with a with a New York street hooker. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been well, there. Yeah, yeah, we've all been there, haven't we, Tom? <laughs> oh, we've all been there. Took um, them back to the Travel Lodge. <laughs> not not Premier Inn. Don't want to spoil it too much. As, as, as soon as I finish this podcast, I'm going to walk the streets of Lancaster. I think it would be... I think, to be fair, I think Lancaster hookers, Newcastle... Uh, not Newcastle. No, Newcastle hookers are completely... They're, they're bottom. Um, but, like... New New York hookers. Well, there's a little bit different there. I thought there's yeah, a bit of a difference. Yeah, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm looking for some, yeah, a nice local Lancastrian whore that I can be listening to. <laughs> is, is my, my... Well, hopefully you don't get disappointed. All right, so I mean, I'm only really joking. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah I, mean, I, I hope you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. I would, I would definitely be. I, I think I'd be a rom com. I think I'd be played by Hugh Grant. Okay. Like, what what rating would it be? Eighteen plus, fifteen, twelve A. You know, gotta watch it with an adult. I don't really think that my life, if if my whole life was like a three hour movie, mm. I think you'd have to rate the hours differently. <laughs> so I think <laughs> I I think the start, the childhood would maybe be a PG. Be a bit worried if it wasn't. The middle section would be eighteen. <laughs> yeah, the Lancaster hookers would be eighteen plus. They would be yeah. <laughs> And then the final bit, I think I'm going to slip into that. I might even be universal by the end of it. Just a nice guy who's That's ambling good. around, right, so eating crumpets. Full, 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 the full out. circle. Great, like character art, yeah, character yeah. development. That that's which so you'd release it like in throughout. You release it as like a, a like a trilogy. Yeah, you could do it as a trilogy. You could actually, yeah. That would make a lot more sense. That's essentially what that is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my my yeah my 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 first. My first childhood is like sort of a Marvel movie, right? And then the then the middle section is Wolf of Wall Street, and then the final section is like up, like Disney's up. Oh, good oh, okay. choice. There. That's a good. That's a great, that's a great choice, choice, actually. Really that's choice. a great choice. Okay, so. So we'll go to go to your childhood then, and you know Marvel movies. So clearly, I'm presuming there was a lot of like you know you fighting aliens and stuff like that, and all, all that and that jazz in your childhood, right? Um, well, so I don't know if you know about my so my my father is the ex chief of defence staff, so the the head of the entire British military. Mm-hmm. So my childhood was spent moving. Uh, you know, I moved like sixteen different times before I was eighteen. I lived on army barracks in Germany, in Northern Ireland. We had to have bodyguards in Northern Ireland. Um, and as such, I also got sent away to boarding school at six years old. I got sent to an all boys boarding school. So what was oh God! What was that like when you were? What was that like growing up when you were like six years old, having to get sent away from your family? That that feeling when you're only so young. Yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, um, you don't really understand when they leave you at boarding school at six years old. You don't really understand what's going on because yeah. I. I'd been to an open day, and the open day they just sort of take you to boarding school just for the day and yeah. show you what it's like, yeah. and then they collect you at the end. So when I actually started my first full term boarding, so it was like a month or two or whatever, um, my parents left me there, but because I was six, I just assumed they'd collect me at the end of the day. <laughs> so, when the, so when the day finished, I went out to the school gates with all the day kids. And stood there waiting for my parents. Oh. And gradually, all the other kids got taken away by their parents. And so I was just left there. Like, how, how did that? That is heartbreaking. Say, that is that absolutely feel, heartbreaking. How, how did that feel, Tom? Like when you had to, like a teacher had to take you back inside for bed. A teacher, a teacher came out to me and went, "Tom, what are you doing out here?" And I was like, "I'm waiting for my mum." <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I'm doing, you weird woman? And she's like, "Your mum's not coming." I was like, "But what?" <laughs> and then she. At least she didn't go over the line like you know, Tom. Your mum doesn't love you. Like, at least, at least she didn't go in like with that. That, that would have been brutal. She could have gone for that. No, but I sort of got the yeah. I think um, my mum was obviously mortified because it's like. Mm. But the thing is, because because I moved so often, 
you have to send kids to boarding school who are in army, the military, like that. Otherwise, you'd be changing in school every year or two. So it was like the lesser of two evils. Yeah. yeah. And like, it's yeah, no, it, it, it was quite, it's quite hard the first few times, and then you just get used to it. Did, did you enjoy boarding school? And then, and then you about. learn to emotionally suppress yourself. <laughs> <laughs> And then you don't cry. <laughs> that, 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 that emotion, that yeah, emotion, you, that great way to suffer. Fully, yeah, and you can never fully open up to your girlfriends and uh, you can Unless never got one. No. Talk, talk sincerely to your mates. <laughs> <laughs> all because when you're in year six, your parents forgot to collect you. All, all because of that. <laughs> Character building, Tom. Character building. Do you, how, how was that experience of boarding school, Tom, then? Because you obviously said that then, you know, it was sad the first few times, but you realised it was the lesser two evils. Did you enjoy boarding school in comparison? I know, obviously, you weren't in, like, regular school moving around all the time, but do you think that that maybe helped you shape you into the person you are today and, and maybe, like, why you went into comedy and you were able to self-deprecate and stuff like that? Definitely, it definitely did. I mean, um, it was good and bad experiences, to be honest, going to boarding school. I loved a lot of it and obviously it gives you a lot of opportunity to do a lot of things because the schools have got a lot of facilities um i had an all right time at the start then i went through a stage where i didn't have a good time basically i got i got bullied quite badly in the middle of it okay, because yeah, i yeah. had i was in the choir and i had acne so i mean to be fair tom being in the choir Easy. like you probably were asking for can, him can, in the can choir. you blame him can you blame him <laughs> Yeah, choir and acne. I mean, I sounded like an angel, but I looked like a pizza. So it was never, <laughs> never going to be a great time for me. But what happened was the, the, the saving grace was when I was 17 years old, in a school of 600 boys, they went co-ed for the first time in their history, and they let 22 girls join my year. Oh, my word. That must have been carnage. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the original Jurassic Park, but you know when they're lowering the camera into the raptor pen? <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was coming, that's why I laughed. Oh, damn. Was, the thing is, I say it was brutal, it was actually, because you, you'd think the boys would like, be like, like go crazy, but actually we were terrified. <laughs> No, we'd never seen girls seen before. Girl. And we didn't know how to talk. Did you? Would you just go up to them and just like, 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 just prod them? And be like, what is this? Like, what? what I don't want to know what this is. Well, we weren't actually allowed to go up to. Them. There was a thing called the six-inch rule, where you weren't allowed within six inches of a girl, so you couldn't hold hands or hug them or anything, because they were so scared that because it was their first year going coed, they were so petrified that just all the girls would get pregnant in the first. Term. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but by doing that, by not to be, we weren't allowed to sort of be together publicly. But by doing that, that meant that loads of, we'd sneak off and we'd have to do it secretly, which, you know, had, it, it was actually worse because they were too strict about it. Yeah, I know, because obviously, like, if they open about it, like, you're going to be more, like, it's, if they're open about it, but there's going to be, like, breaking the rules, like, it's still going to happen either way, isn't it? It's going to happen either way, so you might as well let it happen naturally in yeah. public rather than force people to do it in secret. Yeah. I mean, I didn't particularly, I mean, I was still like old singing spotty bloke. But what I did do is I um, I basically had just a lot more friends in drama right. class. And so, and so all those sort of real sort of hard jock lads who couldn't speak to girls were sort of like, ah, oh, Tom's friends with all the girls now. I'm going to be friends with him so I'm going to try and get to the girl. So actually... So it's the best thing that could happen to you. Yeah, it really saved me a lot. I've got a lot to be thankful for. <laughs> the, women of my life always, the women of my life have always come in and saved me. They've always been great. What, I, what, what are people in boarding school like? Because, I mean, we all went to sort of... What are they? Like, pub, is it public? Is yeah, it public. public, yeah, public either yeah. one, like... Is that, can you notice a difference when you're like seeing people after school? Like, can you tell the difference whether they went to boarding or just sort of normal public school? Well, um, yeah, uh, yes, I think, I think you can. You can normally tend to, there's an air of, of private school boys, I feel. <laughs> yeah. There's just something you can sort of tell. There's that sort of, all that raw wears my back, you know, all that sort of thing. <laughs> Have you actually heard that? Have you actually heard that statement be said? Well, like, have you heard that, or is that like, is that a myth? Um, 
Or have you ever said yeah, it, Tom? I mean, all, you know, all my parents, all, all my parents' school mates all smoke straight, so they don't have baccy. Right. <laughs> um, but I know rolling. Actually, straight cigarettes and rolling cigarettes are posh or chavy, depending on what area of the country you're in. Actually, yeah. I know that really? like, rollies in like Devon, I think, are really like raw. Where's my baccy? Whereas baccy, where I was from, well, that wouldn't that have been that have been the the townie. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but I, uh, yeah, I think there is definitely a certain air. Uh, the thing that like, when I do my TikToks and social media, the biggest slam I get is people saying, "Rah, where's my back in the comment section?" Or <laughs> tell me, tell me you're a Tory without telling me you're a Tory. I mean, the, I'm not a Tory, but like, people just assume I am just because of my accent. Yeah, no, it's so like we'll go to uni, and, like because obviously, like me and Johnny are Southern, you will like instantly be assumed that you're a Tory, all yeah. because like you just speak. Oh, because you're southern, don't basically. Have a northern accent, basically. And then the insult will be, "Oh, that you're a Tory." Like, yeah. Yeah, that, that is the insult, isn't it? Like, that's the biggest insult anyone can give it's you. It's the one. It's the fact because you're not. That's the bit where yeah. you're like, "But I'm not." No, no, it's it's quite a young person's insult. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think when when you get when you get a bit older, you realise that the oh. world's a bit greyer and bad people on both sides. But definitely. At the moment, it's very much a useful thing to go, oh, you're a Tory, are you? And, that, and that's like, really. <laughs> I was going to say, if I, I couldn't insult my nan by, by going, oh, yeah, you're a Tory nan. Like, I don't think she takes it realistically that well as much as the younger generation would do. Yeah, I know. It's interesting, isn't it? But, um, yeah, so I think um, I've definitely, yeah, I've definitely experienced, you know, that sort of, there is an air about some... Um, some private school people. I think I went to a northern private school, which are, are slightly less pretentious than the southern ones. Right. How so? Like, what, what's, what, what would you think the difference was? I think that the people in the southern one, that there's the more ex- expensive private schools. Private schools also have a hierarchy. Mm. You know, this, when you get into the, they're called the, is it the Caledonian Nine? They're the top private schools in the country. So that's your Eatons and your Harrows mm. and your uh, rugby, your Wellingtons. That's sick. people with serious money go there. Yeah. In research of this, Tom, we did look at a bit of your stand-up comedy. So we've we've researched quite a bit and we've watched quite a bit. We've researched quite a lot. Like I feel like we've actually got like a like a um, like a sort of like a Very map of what we've done. Really. We, know, we know who you are, Tom. You're not hiding from us. <laughs> um, but you said in one of your stand-up pieces about uh, like posh surnames and and uh, and double-barrel surnames. What what is the weirdest double-barrel surname you've come across? Like at a private school. Oh God! I mean, I've um, there's people I I've, I've heard of who have triple barrel surnames. What? Yeah, and I don't even quite. I think that's when someone with a double barrel surname then marries someone else who also wants to add their name. So there's like, you end up. <laughs> it ends up. It ends up. Your whole name sounds like a waitress shopping list. <laughs> <laughs> <That's ridiculous. laughs> oh dear! It is. Market, Noloza, Menguano, Oregano, Tamsin, Chamomile. Oh, God. Is that is, is that is that you just coming off? Is that from experience? That feels like that feels like that's actually yeah. that's actually a name you've that known. Is someone you just made out. <laughs> I know, yeah, that's. <laughs> I have a few, yeah. I had a Noloza in my in my school. The thing, the thing is, actually, I think double barrel surnames are actually. Um, they're not just posh anymore, actually. I think because um, there's a lot of people whose parents aren't together when mm. they are born. So I think now double barrels, I don't think the joke quite works as well now. I think there's more people <laughs> from, a vari- from a wider variety of walks of life who have double barrels turn in town. But as far as like stereotypes of posh people, it, it sort of still lands. Have you, have you got to choose like be like really strategic with who you tell the sort of like, I mean that joke and other jokes in front of like if you know audiences may be more double barreled I don't know but like sort of with other <laughs> jokes as well do you have to like be strategic in terms of what jokes you tell in front of different audiences yes I think so but I think I might pick different bits of material for different places and areas and stuff like I've got you know it, it's called like postcode 
material mm -hmm. where you can do stuff that's very, very, for example, if you did a, if you've got a routine on the London underground, you, you wouldn't do that in North Yorkshire. Yeah. Like, no. But, um, but most of the time you should, I think a lot of the art of storytelling is, is making it relatable to the audience. So most topics you should be able to get other people on board. Mm -hmm. I actually find that in more working class areas, I go down better because I'm very honest about my upbringing mm. and they actually really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Cause, it, cause I'm, a novel, I'm a novelty and I take the mickey out of where I'm from. Whereas so in more uh, sort of upper class areas, they get a bit defensive about it because I'm taking the piss out of them. Them, yeah, that's the thing. That's true. Yeah. Have, have you ever had like, have you ever misjudged that? Like, say, in like a in a in a like a performance and stuff like that, where you maybe misjudged the joke and like the audience that you're going for. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what was that? When when did that happen? Put it more bluntly, I've died on my ass in many many places. <laughs> are, you, are you sure you're good at comedy? <laughs> <laughs> You know, actually, one of the hardest places to gig I've found is that I, I did a gig at Goldsmiths University, which is a very progressive, woke university yeah. in London. Ah. And the students there just get so offended by everything. Or they, and because this it happened the other night, actually, I, I did a, a student gig and there were some Irish girls, they were 19 years old. And as soon as I said that my dad was in the British military, they just booed me for the entire set. <laughs> <laughs> And they were like, because we're Irish and you're British military. It's like, you're a 19-year-old girl. Don't pretend like you were in the troubles or you know what's going on. <laughs> well, you're over here. You live in Clapham. You're going to a Brit an English university. And I, I, after the gig, they came up to me and went, oh, come to our pub. We'll give you free drinks. It's like, what do you reckon? Why would I want to hang out with you now? You're just ruining <laughs> you for my entire set. <laughs> oh, dear. Nah. That would have... So sometimes... Sorry, I got to see you. Sometimes you just get those gigs where people just don't like you and you can't help it. It's it's What's the worst one you've had? The one of the worst well, the worst the worst death I ever had was at the comedy store in London, and that's because it was the comedy store in London. It's such a prestigious venue and you walk yeah. in and you know, there's a big massive black and white picture of Robin Williams as you walk in. You see you're walking through going all these greats have been on this stage. And I had this, um, uh, I, was, I was too green to be trying the gig. Mm. And I had this whole, my opening gag, which wasn't even really a gag. It was me going, oh, my dad's in the military, but I wasn't ever gonna join the military. Uh, I think doubts were raised ever since I was age seven and I was on the foot of the stairs performing Cats the Musical. <laughs> And that's not really a joke, is it? The, the joke is, I'm camp, and my dad wasn't. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's not very good. <laughs> and so I, um, I went on stage, and what you should do when you go on stage, you need to like walk on and give the audience a little bit of time to go, who's this guy? Mm -hmm. And not panic and be like, right, I'm here, take me in. I'm in control, I'm managing the room. But I didn't, I just walked around and went, oh my God, my dad's in the army, but I will not, because I'm going to catch the musical. <laughs> and it was like a really big performance. And I tell you, I've never felt silence, but it hit me like this, like this tangible, solid thing went bang, and it was just nothing. How? I was in there and was like, huh? <laughs> Did you, I'm surprised you just didn't walk off just like just head down walk no, off you, yeah, I, was I, it. I looked and they call it the death bead the bead of sweat starts going yeah. down your brow hmm. and as soon as the audience then see you sweating they go oh this guy's rubbish and then how yeah. hard is that to and like come off, back from though the, the, the MC when I came off the MC went they were probably just more dog people <laughs> <laughs> Is, is that the key? Um, Sorry, is that the key to like comedy is like sort of like trial and error sort of thing and like just seeing these jokes and the jokes that do bomb and that you learn more from the, maybe the ones that, are, that do well almost? Oh, definitely. Like, I mean, the key, the key to getting good at anything is trial and error. Mm, yeah. Uh, literally anything. You, you fail and you fail and you keep failing until one time you succeed and then you fail loads more and then you succeed two times and then you just keep going and keep going. And, um, the thing is, like, 
you've got to learn to appreciate the failure because that's the only way you put yourself out of your comfort zone is the only way you improve in life. If you get to a stage where you're doing something and you're always succeeding, that means you're not actually testing yourself anymore. Mm -hmm. So you've got to take risks. Yeah. And the real benefits comes when you don't look at it as a failure, you just look at it as a learning curve. Mm. And I'll tell you one thing, for being a comedian when you get in this game long enough, when you die on stage, that's a good story to tell in the dressing room. Yeah. Because comedians, we never want to hear about the times that each of us smashed the gig. We all want to talk about the times we died. Mm. So whenever you're dying on stage, just remember, it's the death on stage, but it'll be a amazing story in the dressing room. Yeah. I suppose, <laughs> nice. can, can you use almost those stories then in your future comedy pieces when like you're not dying on stage and you can use them to sort of Almost turn it into a joke, yeah. Well, you can, you, can you, you can certainly use it on midweek podcasts that you're on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> midweek, long whilst while you're in Lancashire and it's, it's like half two. Exactly. My, my first ever death I had, this was a bad death, but I, um, I went to Bex Hill and I was in a tea room, there was about 50 people in, and the guy before me was a, a local scaffolder who, um, he wasn't a comedian. But he, what, all he, he brought 20 of his mates along and he, he'd just gone to Cicopedia and printed off a load of jokes yeah. and he went on before me and just read them off a piece of paper and he blew the roof off. Everyone <laughs> went mad. And I was like, what? Like, oh, like, he was being carried out on people's shoulders after this. So I was like, that's... And when I went on, I went on straight after him, the only noise you could hear in the crowd were his mates... And they were watching the video they had just taken of him <laughs> on their phone. So they filmed his set, and then when I came on, they just rewatched his set straight away on their phone during my set. <laughs> so they weren't even listening to you. Not even listening to me. Oh, that's all. Has there, has there ever been any times where you've sort of like thought maybe that comedy like isn't like where you've done a set or maybe thing you just thought you know I'm giving up comedy or has it always been that you'll keep going? I've never thought I'd give up, no. This is, I've literally got no other options now. I've got no transferable skills. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I, you could go to Cats the Musical. Sorry? You could go into a part of Cats the Musical. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'd have to be like, I'd have to be like the oldest cat who just sort of sits there and licking his ass. Yeah, you'll be like the you'll be like the fourteen year old cat that's on a, a, a bunch load of drugs and just sitting in the corner, not near death's door. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't be any no. I'm, I'm no I'm no kitten anymore. But um, there is well, yeah. I don't know. No cats. The musical. There is Gus the theatre cat, who's a really old cat. So I could bring, maybe play him. Yeah. Say. Well, uh, what about um we, we we again we did our research and we we really we, we found come across that you told a story that you tried to run away at home as a kid, is that correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, you, you really did your research. <laughs> <laughs> it was just in an article that you told them that you ran that you um that, that, that you uh, you said that you ran away as a We're kid. We're in like, your what? hotel room, Tom. <laughs> you know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> what what was that um, story? How did that come about? That's quite a long story. Um, I, it was when my dad, and my, well, my dad and I, my family was uh, living in Northern Ireland. And so we lived in an army barracks, uh, you know, surrounded by like 12 foot of barbed razor wire because yeah. of, you know, the troubles and the conflicts over there. Yeah. Um, and me and my sister had been arguing, classic like sibling fight. Yeah. You know, like it's like UFC, but less rules and no ref. Because <laughs> my sister was going through her witch phase. So she was like, watch, like watching Sabrina and the craft and Buffy the Vampire Slayer with like dyed eyes and dog collars. And I was like, playing there. Crash Bandicoot. It's on, a weird on clash. One. That's a weird, weird clash of Crash Bandicoot and, and maybe Gothic Sister. <laughs> clash Bandicoot, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, um, 
She'd taken my game out without saving it. This was back in the day where... Oh, no, that crosses the line, that. That that really... That, that is... No wonder you tried to run away from that. Line, I, I'd have left before that. Yeah, to I just did. So, and, but also, so I'd like... Piss, I was like pistol whipping her with the remote control. Yes. And she was I mean, like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. She was like summoning this spirit of Cthulhu or whatever. <laughs> oh. And... Um, my mum had taken my sister's side because I was the oldest one and I should know better. And it's like, that's not fair. Yeah, <laughs> always that. happens. Yeah, I get always happens. A lot of bollocks. A lot of bollocks. <laughs> always really happens. Well, like, so I, I decided to run away from home, but I'd only ever seen people run away from home. I was like eight or nine. I'd only ever seen people run away from home in like Famous Five movies or Huckleberry Finn. But like it's old yeah. school. Yeah, yeah. So my, my tactic, my, that was my only frame of reference. So when I ran away from home, what I did, I got one of my dad's handkerchiefs like, and I made like eight peanut butter sandwiches and put it in the handkerchief and <laughs> slid it onto the stick. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what to do for water, so I just got a cup and filled it up at the tap. <laughs> <laughs> The cane downstairs is like, right, go and tap. I'm leaving. I can't <laughs> live anymore in this tyranny. <laughs> um, my mum was one of those 90s mums. She, she doesn't care. She's like, yeah, whatever, dinner's at seven. So I stormed out. And I, the thing is, obviously, I was living on an army barracks. So I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't try and climb the fence. Well, thank God, because like you can imagine, my dad was the head of the British military. Imagine the imagine the son, the son of, the... <laughs> of the head of the British military walking around an estate in Belfast at the time of the Troubles with with, a with peanut butter sandwiches, sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> with peanut butter sandwiches with a picnic on a stick. It's a good a little, it's a good distraction dad, tactic to be water. fair. <laughs> I, I did that once. I, I was like when I, I when I was like year I was like not year eight. I was like eight years old, and like I, I try. I thought like I had an argument with my parents. I didn't have like a brother or a sister, so I've gone to like I've gone to leave home, and um, and I've literally I've got right, mum. I'm leaving home, and she's like, okay then. So she's like pack my bag, put loads of stuff in it. I've got a rucksack. I'm like I'm gonna take the dog with me as well. So I've got the dog with me, like my cocker spaniel rucksack on. Mum's sending me out. I've gone like steps out stepped out the door. And I'm like, I'm leaving, Mum. And then, like, my neighbour was just there, like, staring at me as I've walked out the door. And then I've just thought, no, I'm not leaving. The embarrassment was too much. I've just gone straight back inside. <laughs> I used to... With a dog in a bag? With a dog in the bag? <laughs> yeah. no, unfortunately, not. It wasn't. But I didn't know. In your head, like, when you're eight years old, you think, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. The dog's definitely going to survive, isn't he? If we, like, leave yeah. home. I ran away from home bare feet yeah, when I was about last week. Six or five. <laughs> yeah. yeah, back to uni. <laughs> walked bare foot. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I can't remember what I was angry about, but I just walked around the block with no socks on, just on gravel, and was like, like gave, gave it ten minutes and thought, nah, fuck this. I'm going back home. But <laughs> it proved a point. That's it proved a point. It's exactly what you do. All I did was I literally, I walked around the block once, and I sat down, I ate all the sandwiches. Of course. Then got bored, <laughs> and was like, Went back home, carried on playing Crash Bandicoot. That, that, that <laughs> reminds me of the, you know, the, the famous video of that that uh, guy in America who goes like, "I'm packing my bags," and then he goes like, uh, "With the chicken nuggets, like my family." You know, the guy who leaves home. Never heard of that. I'm gonna lie, you're on your own. Chicken nuggets, are like my family. I've that never, I've never, You've never seen, seen that, that video. No. Have you seen that, Tom? I'm not. See, you just insane. I'm, I'm really sorry, man. I really want to say I have seen this, but I'm afraid. You lot are gonna get no slaughtered. When this gets put on TikTok, you lot are gonna get slaughtered. No. Like bacon is like three bacon is Sorry, mate. Friend. I know bacon is good, but I know. Same, oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, mate. The same same there we go. <laughs> I didn't realise it was the same. Wow. Bloke. Wow. Well, that bomb. That, I died there, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, really? that was a death. <laughs> I died there. That's my first death. Pat is going to get so angry now he's going to run away. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm actually going to pack my bag now. We're just going to see him with his peanut butter sandwiches just leaving our house. Some just... run someone's dog. Not even his dog. <laughs> someone's <laughs> dog. Someone's dog. dog. I, would, I, would, I would argue peanut butter sandwiches is a good sandwich to, 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 to have made. I hate peanut butter, so I'm not... Yeah, I, can't yeah, I don't agree. like peanut butter. I don't like peanut butter, no. yeah. No. Um, you... <laughs> When you did um your uh, you did a gap year, didn't you? Uh, you, you did did a say, gap speaking year. of running away, you yeah. ran away on a gap year. I did, yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, we and also um, know what you did on you, that gap year. We you, were there. You, you got fired as a as a stripper in Australia, right? Yeah. 
there. Allow it. Were you there? <laughs> what? We, yeah. fired, we fired you. We're, we were the customers. <laughs> yeah. You're a shit stripper. That's amazing. Uh, I don't think you were even... How old are you guys? 20. 20. 19. 20, yeah. So you guys would have been about two or three years old. Yeah, it was the worst experience <laughs> of my life. I hated it. I hated every second of it. So the fact that you guys were in that nightclub, you got some very irresponsible parents if you were... No, we ran yeah, away. Just, we, just, we, ran yeah, away. we ran away. We ran away. Two years old. Went to Australia. We thought, away. sat home in a strip uh, club. We, we had three of you on each other's shoulders in a long match. Yeah. 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 With a dog. <laughs> Josh has grown a beard by then, so we got away with it. But look, no, how did you get fired? I mean, how did you become a stripper to start with? <laughs> so, my friend Tim and I, uh, Tim and Tom, I mean, we were doing a, we were going to do a round the world trip. We ended up in Adelaide and we didn't have any money. And we heard of this place called the Crazy Horse, which is still going in Adelaide. Um, and it was run by Madame Josephine, oh, no. who's uh, this lovely bloke oh, no, who we walked in and we were like, right, we're going to, we, we want to. We thought it'd be a funny story, and he was like, "Oh my god, right! You guys, you can do a live um, British stripping sex show together." And they were like, "Sure, you know what? That's fine." <laughs> and then he was like, "Right, come in tomorrow." And we had the whole the payment at the time was fifteen dollars uh, Australian dollars. The house kept five dollars. You kept ten dollars, and you had to dance for one song. Oh. And it was all for hen parties. Oh. So they'd give you fifteen dollars and you'd get you'd like have a towel and a thong on and you'd open your towel up and you'd dance around and <laughs> Were you wearing that thong already? Or was that like did you put it on for the thing? <laughs> yeah. So um did I own a thong already? No, yeah, no, 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 it was that you just wear that every single day, just had that thong on. No, um I we I actually it was my first time wearing a thong. Um no, that's not true, actually. No, that's not true. I've been there a couple of times. <laughs> but we went, we went out and we bought special thongs. We bought special Union Jack thongs. Nice touch. Nice. Good touch. Because we were, we were the British act. Mm. Um, we also, though, to the night before, we thought strippers have to be, you know, pumped up and muscular and they have to be hairless. So we went out and we got fake tan and um, hair removal cream. Did that oh, cost no. more than the money you made? Yeah, but you got it the best to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, put, to put on a good show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we were talking, this was a long-term strategy. Yeah, no, I get it. Invest, invest, well invest, in the, invest in the process. I get it, I get it. Yeah. Oh, we'll make this back in a month. Easy. Um, so the night before, we, we, used, we used the fake tan and we did loads of exercise to pump, pump ourselves up, but we also used the hair removal cream. But because we wanted to be as, as like, hairless as possible, we used it um, about five times <laughs> that evening, just five times. Oh. Oh, and no. obviously it's very, um, it, it burns the yeah. hair off, that's how it does it. But also mixed with the, the fake tan <laughs> and the sweat from exercising, Meant we came out in this orangey red rash all over our bodies, <laughs> like and an oompa loompa that's had like an allergic reaction. <laughs> my entire body looked like my face at boarding school. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that when we actually arrived at the crazy horse the next day for work, and we'd done this thing like we we got in our thongs, we we tied the elastic band round our penises. Do you know that that trick? No. Uh, no? no. <laughs> Definitely not. A, a trick, a trick, this is a trick of the trick, a trick strippers do is they get themselves sort of semi-erect and then they tie the base of their penis off with an elastic band to make themselves look bigger. Okay. Oh, wow, okay. Did I normally? Yeah. You don't need that, do you, John? We're, we're laughing and learning in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm making notes here, just, you know, just a tip for the bedroom. <laughs> Boy, elastic just, band. <laughs> so look myself bigger. <laughs> Sheffield Student Union doesn't know what it's got in store for me. <laughs> yeah, we instantly we just start stripping in the union, instantly get arrested. But at least our penis looked like five inches bigger. That's fine. So if you imagine now, it's me and my friend Tim and these Union Jack Thongs walking around with a rashy orange red body 
Oh, penis is tied in rubber bands. <laughs> Attempting to um, get dancers off the hen party. And just no one was... We were getting comments of what the hell's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't even drag a hen party towards us. <laughs> we, we, we didn't get a single dance to just told guys, go home, it's not working. Did you get paid? <laughs> they, they, they gave you the it's not it's not you it's me sort of line. <laughs> no, it's not me. It's definitely no, you. Great. It's, it's, it's definitely you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you get paid for it though, Tom? Did you get paid for work that night? No. So, so you made a loss. That, yeah, that, right. that venture was actually yeah. a loss. Yeah. All that money invested in hair removal cream and elastic bands and bonds. Never saw it back. <laughs> what What were some other like like when you went on your gap year? What were some other like standout moments from like? Because I imagine there's some some like moments that happened in a gap year. Yeah, there was by the end of it because we we spent all our money and we didn't earn any. Yeah, I don't know if you can tell by that story I just told, but we weren't taking <laughs> employment particularly seriously. <laughs> um, so we ended up going to Las. LA mm. and then Las Vegas mm. and then in Las Vegas it was so stupid we went to North America to America rather than South America but we were only 18 at the time so we couldn't I do anything drink, yeah. we couldn't um, drink or, or gamble or we went to Las Vegas at 18 pointless we met a coke dealer called Brian <laughs> <laughs> that, that, a coke dealer called Brian is not the way to go you know um, that's no, that... we met, we met him outside the Mandalay Bay Hotel and he went, guys, oh, if you're 18, don't worry, give us all your money and I'll go in there and I'll gamble for you and give you the winnings. And we were like, okay. We <laughs> gave him like $200 each. Oh, and he ran away. <laughs> <laughs> with, a, with a bunch of peanut butter sandwiches on the stick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's like, he's like, I want the money, but I definitely want the peanut butter sandwiches. Yeah. It's a no-no deal. No, to, I mean, to be perfectly honest, he wasn't that hungry. <laughs> Oh, and so we then had no money and so we went we had, we had like fifty dollars or something and we went do you know we'll go to the Greyhound bus station and we'll, we'll, we'll just go wherever the next people in the line go which was Arizona so we ended up in the middle of Arizona which is like the hottest place ever with no <laughs> money so my pet we went we it was such a <laughs> stupid idea so we, we, we said to our parents oh can we get a bus fare you get, give, give us some money. And um, they sent us money to get a Greyhound bus to, we had uh, we had some military army American friends, like a nice family who lived in, Hugh, well, we thought they lived in Houston, Texas. So we spent the money and got a Greyhound bus all the way to Houston, Texas. But when we arrived, we realised we'd got to the wrong place and they were actually in Austin, Texas. Oh, <laughs> oh no. no. So we had to sleep rough on the streets of Houston. Blimey. And me, me and my mate Tim, no money. We'd all got like Snoop Dogg and D12 sun vases on <laughs> and our little flip flop pops. And it was awful. <laughs> we got picked up by the police. <clears throat> Who, who, who took us to a drug and alcohol rehab centre. <laughs> <laughs> they think you were... Did, did, you do a, did you do a strip in front of them we as were, well? We were, we, were, we were running away drug addict alcohol kids. <laughs> I mean, to and be fair, if you're wearing sleep, sleep, uh, flip-flops and a Snoop Dogg hat, they probably think you're completely off your nut. <laughs> yeah, we, we look insane. And so we went there and we arrived at like three... Uh, sorry, uh, like, you know, midnight, whatever. And you go in there and they all sleep you all in this massive big room. And it's all full of, it's full of like crack addicts and gangsters who are all either being arrested or like, you know, going cold turkey. Yeah. So the whole night, all you can hear is people scratching and screaming and moaning and like twitching. <laughs> and we thought, me and my friend Tim, because we were so, we were so nervous, we thought, we'll sleep by the water fountain. So if we're thirsty, we don't have to get up and walk Smart. in the night. Smart. No, terrible idea. <laughs> because... Everyone else wants to get to the water fountain at night and you're in the way. <laughs> <laughs> and we were there and I, I tell you, we, we lay our, our heads down next to the water fountain. The deepest voice I've ever heard came from the darkness just going, I wouldn't lie there if I were you. <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you thought that was it? 
yeah, yeah, we thought the devil had come to take us. And it was just this massive big bloke who, was, who then explained that's where everyone's going to go throughout the night. So just go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I don't think we, I don't think we slept a single wink in the evening. We knew, even when he went to the toilets, none of the toilet cubicles had doors on. Oh. You needed to go to the toilet in front of people because it didn't want anyone shooting up or doing anything. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And then you had to wake up at five in the morning to go for prayers because it's an American, so obviously they want sort of, you know, American deep south. Of course, yeah. But the the matron was called Miss Merriweather, who was this like massive black woman who was like, oh, I know you're going to be doing stuff in there. You know, that sort of woman. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Apologies for the accent, but that is what she's found. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to get cancelled. Um, I don't know how big our American audience is, to be honest. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't, think, I don't think we've reached too global yet. <laughs> I'm sure you're fine. And then you, and then we had to go for like breakfast at half five, six o'clock, which was like proper like canteen, like Shawshank Redemption. And we were just really scared to talk to anyone. Um, sorry, Tom. To- long tables. Tom, interrupt. Sorry. Not- did you not at any sorry? point? Did you not at any point think to tell anyone that you weren't like crack addicts, or did you just want us somewhere to stay for the night? <laughs> we didn't have a choice. They said you've got to stay in here. It was a cleaning the streets up, and then you've got to stay here. Okay. But then in the daytime, they let you out, and so we went to an internet cafe, and we had one email to our parents saying, Fuck. We've been picked up by the police, we're in a drug and alcohol rehab centre, and then suddenly a thousand pounds each just got transferred into the oh. <laughs> Well, so I know what to do now if I need yeah. money from my parents. Get, <laughs> get, get out of there. And it was like, yeah, okay. So then we got another Greyhound bus. Um, from the south of Texas to New York, and then flew home. Oh, oh but I'm bloody hell. Yeah. So basically, if we have money for our parents, we'll just say we're in a... Yeah, we're going to re- yeah, yeah, rehab yeah. 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 Or called university, either yeah. one. Yeah. I, I was chatting to my friend, um, my friend Jamali Maddox, who does, um, he does documentaries on Vice, called Hate Thy Neighbour. Oh, yes. Yeah, you yeah, might yeah. have seen them. Yeah, absolutely, Jamal, yeah. a friend of mine. I was telling me, I'll tell you in that story, and he was like, yeah, Tom, that's why... I know that you and me are from different backgrounds. Because if I had told my parents that I was in that situation, they would have transferred me money. They'd just been like, well, that's where you live now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd speak that most parents, I know like most parents would have been like, they're just like, this is your fault, get yeah, yourself out of it. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, you mentioned there, Tom, I know it was only a brief comment, but you mentioned there about getting cancelled. And obviously, in the light of the recent weeks with Jimmy Carr and everything that's come out with that, with him being cancelled, is it something that you worry about as a comedian, like, being cancelled? Do you have to, like, write jokes and think, oh, maybe I can't say that because that, that could happen? Is that something that you worry about uh, in the current climate of things? I think you're conscious of it. Mm. I don't think it's a worry. Because I, I still think, on the whole... Firstly, it's very hard to get cancelled. Like, Jimmy Carr won't get cancelled. No. His, his, his audience are too big. Yeah. Like, look, look, what, look what happened to Louis C.K. Louis C.K. just then filmed his specials on his own, put it behind a paywall, and still earns millions of pounds. Mm. Um, the, the, the thing about the Jimmy Carr joke I found, it was just a bad joke. Mm. It wasn't very clever or good. Mm-hmm. It was the sort of joke I used to tell at school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I, I was a bit disappointed in the actual quality of the joke more than anything. Mm. Yeah, you just spent, yeah. It, it felt just lazy. Yeah. And not just a, like, what, why? Yeah, I, I get, I, I know. The whole, oh. <laughs> Is that, that's, 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 the, that's the police camp for me. She's the work police. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I like you saying, it, it was, it was almost like, in, it, well, it wasn't in poor taste, but it, it was that aspect of it, wasn't it? Which is why I think he's maybe been pulled up on it. Because uh, Jimmy Carr is one of the people that offends everyone. He goes for everyone, doesn't he? You, no matter if you're yeah. white, you're, you know, you're black, you're straight, you're gay, he will go for you no yeah, matter what background you're That's from. the thing. Do you feel like comedians yeah. are almost a bit uncancellable, if that's a word? Because it is almost like part of the job to take the mic. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I- I don't think you can, certainly at comedians of a certain level, you're going to find it very hard to cancel them. And it's, it's, I mean, 
I get it's quite hard because it is sort of la laughter and humour does exist on the edge of things. It is a, you're meant to naturally push the boundaries, but you're meant to like call out truth when you see it and make people question stuff. Um, and I'm a big believer in free speech, obviously. Any comedian should be. But I, you know, I, all, I do understand that there is a, a responsibility. I think very much the audience dictates, you know, what you can and can't say. And I, I think, um, I think I understand why audiences nowadays go, do you know what, actually just being unnecessarily mean isn't good enough anymore. We need more nuance. I do think, I do think that there are some people who are looking to be offended. But I also think you get these edge lord comedians who they're looking to be offensive. Yeah. And I don't particularly like that. I don't think you should go out to try and be offensive. I think you should be trying to be funny. And if people find it offensive, that's their fault. But yeah, I, I personally, I don't try and be offensive in my material at all. So I, I'm not particularly worried. What, what sort of material would you like your material? Like, what would you say is kind of like, if you compare it to other comedians? Yeah, or who like who is like your inspiration when you write your... your, 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 your... What's it called? Jokes. 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 Yeah, yeah, jokes. Yeah, 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 my, 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 my material. Um, <laughs> well, I, I tend to just write about uh, my my experience. Mm. I think um, I I know that I've found myself in a very unique and privileged position in life. You know, my my dad's a lord. I live in the Tower of London. Ex chief of defence staff of the military. All that's like, you know who the hell ever gets to live in a palace, whoever gets to live that existence. So I want to talk about those things because people find it interesting, but I want to make it accessible because I think at the end of the day, human emotion is universal. You know, it's all, when you talk about running away from home, okay, I'm talking about running away during Northern Ireland from an army barracks, but we've all like, You've all said we've all run away ourselves. We all know what it's like to get angry, to be annoyed, to be so. We all know what it's like to end up in a drug rehabilitation. Rehabil 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 I can't even say the word. Oh, rehabilitation <laughs> unit. Nearly. Nearly, nearly got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Um, But we all know what it's like to be a fish out of water, to be out of our depth, to be in a strange environment. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I, kind of, I, 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 I talk about my own life experiences. And um, and and try and um, I try and make it very sort of open and friendly and honest. I feel like that's very much like Russell Howard. Russell Howard does a similar thing, doesn't he? Where he talks about his experience with his family and and stuff like that. And I feel like that's maybe something like what you do in the sense that you talk about your your background, and you talk about what you've been through and stuff like that, um, to make your story. Yeah. Absolutely. Do most of those stories actually yeah. happen, or are they ex slightly exaggerated? Or are they actually how they happen? Are you trying to tell us? Is anything you've told us? No, 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 I'm not. I'm not is, now the word, get it. Is anything innocent. you've told us this afternoon just complete <laughs> bollocks and none of it's happened? Yeah. Yeah, no, I made the whole thing up. What really happened is I I, I ate a peanut butter sandwich naked once. That's it. That's all right. They got, they got everywhere. They got everywhere. And that's what caused the rush. Yeah, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, um, so, um, on, Josh. No, no, we would get. Yeah, it's no. sorry. No, Tom, please, after you, you go. No, well, I was going to say, there's artistic license when you're writing material, obviously, and you do. When you're when you're writing stuff for the stage, you do bend it slightly, mm. you know, elaborate a bit for the benefit of the listener, but you can't do it too much because I think it becomes quite obvious when someone starts just. Exaggerating, yeah, 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 overly. So you, there's a fine art. I think um, most, all of my stuff is all it's all rooted in truth. Yeah. Oh. What, what's it like as well? Like you said a moment, you're touring with Milton Jones. I mean, he's sort of like a staple name of comedy. Like he's been on Mock the Week uh, like many a time. What's it like working with him? And even like how experienced you are, can you still take stuff from him and, and learn from him as well? Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I've been going thirteen years, but he's been going maybe double that. And he's an amazing person. He's like a, he's like a really generous person, a really great person. Uh, loves talking about comedy. And, you know, after every show, we do sit up and talk. You know, the technique and, and the, the law of it all. 
But also, because these are all 1,000, 2,000 seater venues, mm. and being able to play them five times a week mm. is a huge learning curve. Because, you know, I can play like 100, 100 200 seaters, but the way you perform is obviously very different when you get to 1,000, 2,000, because you have to slow everything down. The, the way it's bigger crowd control, bits of the audience react in different ways. So it's much more like a wave of reaction rather than just a solid reaction. Um, and watching how he does it um, and how being on tour, it, how hard that is, because you know, you're, you're, you're away from home a lot. So this is all a massive learning curve for me, but it's, it's really rare. Yeah. What are the, what have been the challenges then like that have maybe, you obviously that have presented themselves on this tour, like in that, that's the, that's the biggest challenge, like controlling the, like the different, the size of the audience. Do you know what, what the, a really interesting thing that I picked up um, early, we did our first 3,000 seater in Berlin and you're the, only, you're the only one in the room facing the opposite direction to everyone. Yeah. Which is very big. But because there's so many people in the silences, um, you can hear coughing all the time. Oh, mad. Because in a room of like 50 to 100 people, there might be one person with a cough or two. But in 3,000, there might be 40 people who've got coughs. Yeah. So it's always, <coughs> you know, like when a, when a bag of popcorn starts going. Yeah. yeah. It's like that, a coughing version of that. And it's really distracting. But that's like the, sort of the small things that you then realize, oh, that's what happens when there's big rooms of people. So, <laughs> and there's loads of different ones like that. Just, you learn, you know, you can see the people in the front row very easily and you can't see the people at the back. You can't play to the people at the front row, otherwise the people at the back can only see your head. Yeah. So you've got to play it up like that. And just learning all that stagecraft is is really important. Um, uh, we again, uh, as you know, we've done our research. I was going to say so in comparison. Um, we found uh, that we said you, you went on first dates, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you did. I mean, I actually love first dates. What was that like experience like in general? Like, was it fun? Like, what was it like? It's, um, do you know what? It's really nerve wracking because firstly, firstly, I didn't apply for first dates. So a mate of mine called uh, Daniel Sloss. We saw this on Twitter, yeah, because you leaked your address on Twitter, didn't you? I don't think you really realised. Like <laughs> <laughs> <I> what? <laughs> I leaked my address on Twitter. Yeah, because someone put a screenshot of your application and then a while back you said about it, said, and then you said, don't think you want my address being on the internet, mate, and you put, oh, fuck, yes. Probably maybe. can't remember, it was like six years yeah, ago. Yeah, it was like six years ago, to be fair. It was a long while ago. Christ, have you been trolling six years through my Twitter feed? We, we, we've, done our, we've done our research. <laughs> wow, you really have. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my mate, Dan... My mate, uh, Danny Sloss, who, um, he's got a few specials on Netflix that you, you should check out. He's great. He's very bad. Um, he applied me for first dates behind my back and I didn't know. So I just got this phone call out of nowhere going, Tom, we really like your profile. Um, would you like to do it? And I was like, oh, and I was single at the time. So I was like, yeah, right, I'll do it. Um, and you have to go through loads of different evaluations and stuff to make sure you're not insane. Cause I did the, um, the, a broad version, so they got flown over to France. It's quite and lovely. It's nerve wracking because you go on a first date, that's nerve wracking anyway, <coughs> but it's the first date where all your friends and family and 10 million viewers are going to be watching it. And not only that, is you know that you are, you'll meet the blind date, but she's not completely chosen at random. There's a whole production team who have got together and gone, right, there's this person, who do we think is about their standard? <laughs> <laughs> so if you ended up with like a zero out of 10? <laughs> well, that's it. If some bloody hunchback comes popping through the door, who's like, you know, sorry I'm late, but I was licking the pavement outside. Like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. they think, that's what the production team think of me. They think I'm that yeah. low in standard. <laughs> You are, you are literally being met face-to-face -face with your standards. 
Yeah. With, with what your standards should be. Evaluated professionally by a whole psychiatrists, therapists, and a whole production team. Were, were you offended? I was highly complimented. Ben yeah. Bella was beautiful and lovely, and uh, I had a wonderful day. I was very, very happy. She, she's a, a magical girl. What what ha- what happened with what happened in the end? Because obviously, like I, I, I think it end, it looked like it ended well. Did it did it did it stay well or like what happened with that in the end? She's now my girlfriend. No, no. it ended. It, the actual date that well the the day of the evening ended with a a very um a very lovely and proper smooch just outside her. We saw that on TV. Her, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got so many compliments from that about how smooth that kiss was. Oh, really? yeah. I, was like, I was very nervous. I, I was very nervous doing it. I mean, I would be like, you uh, might just get comments like, oh, that guy kisses with his eyes yeah. open. Like, what is he doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just licked, licked her face. <laughs> and then the next day we went on a, oh, we went on a second date. And this actually got broadcast, but I don't think you can find it anymore. But, um, her the thing she did she was a life drawer so she paints she drew and painted naked people okay okay so they they'd set me up and i ended up going on a date the second day and she i got naked by a river and she painted me oh my uh, god like a, with like a picnic basket in front of my, my myself yeah. <laughs> The baguette sticking out. Yeah, you, did you? Did you didn't do that trick with the elastic band? Um, did you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should have. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think I'm the only person who's ever been who's ever got fully naked on first dates. So wow. that's, that's a good thing. Oh, to, go. Did they make you get naked, or was it like you were like, no, I will. Like they weren't like for the TV. They didn't make me, but I sort of in my head as soon as you went, I'm a life drawer, and I was like, I'm a comedian. I was like. They set oh, this up. <laughs> That's what they. they, 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 they there's only one way this goes, and it's I mean, badly. In my head, I went, you know, you get to these, you get to these stages in life. We go, do I want to tell the story where I nearly did something, or do I want to do this and have this story? It's yeah, like, it's true. You've got to have the story. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's all about memories, isn't it? All about like, like making memories and stuff like that. No one wants to hear the story where you nearly did something. Yeah, it's true. true. Hear the story where it happened. Well, as well, Tom. Again, we did our research, and we also found out you've been on another TV show. You went on roast battles. I did. Yes. Did. <laughs> What's, what, what, what was that like? What? Because I always, I always wonder watching that. What the process is like behind? Do you yeah. do you get a chance to write stuff prior, and do you get stuff okay that you can and can't say to the other person? Um, and I think the process has cha- changed over the seasons of Throws Back. Right. Uh, and I think, I remember, I remember being a bit annoyed, if I'm honest, because it was all just this no holes barred. Right. But then I, I submitted some jokes, and they're like, you can't say these jokes. Because it's like, well, hang on a second. What's, yeah. literally the strap line of your show is, it's no holes barred, and now you're telling me to bar all the holes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very set. Yeah. Um, but what was really nice is that I did it with Lauren Pattinson, mm-hmm. who's a uh, she's a really good friend of mine. So roast battles are always more fun when you're both friends. Yeah. And you're yeah. Doing it yeah you're not just insulting a stranger. Yeah, you know where the boundaries are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So again, it was really it was nerve wracking, but you you do you do you submit the jokes you're going to use. Right. And then. But then when you're actually on it, in the heat of the moment, you come out with various ad-libs and poppers and stuff. And I did, you know, I did it, the judges, the, one, the time I did it were Jimmy Carr, yeah. Catherine Ryan, and Jonathan Ross, yeah. which was always very nice. Yeah. yeah. And there's, you know, I knew, I knew Catherine from beforehand, but I, I'd never met Jonathan Ross, and I'd met Jimmy Carr maybe a couple of times. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, it was it was nice, and then obviously you've got all the other comedians because they film two episodes a day. So that in the evenings, so 
backstage you've got all the other comedians who are on the show and we all know each other so that was really nice mm-hmm. it, was, it was a really nice experience it was, it was a really fun show have you ever had um like Sorry, sorry. When you, you just, like, you've obviously met like quite a few comedians and stuff like that, and like people maybe maybe idolised growing up. And when you were kind of, have you ever had like an embarrassing moment where you've met someone and like an embarrassing thing or anything like that? I've had a few. Like, I've had some real dreams come true. I mean, I've you know, Shane Michael McIntyre was one of the biggest things. That was really lovely. Mm-hmm. And um, I wasn't another solo then. I, I was in my old group that I was in. And he was on after us, but I remember halfway through the set, seeing that he'd come to the side of the stage and was watching us, because we'd been having a good gig. So he'd come mm-hmm. and started watching, and as we came off stage, he went, well, that was amazing. How, how am I ever going to follow that? And I was like, oh my God, that's so lovely. Yeah. Just to get that yeah. sort of I mean, he did follow it, and he did much better. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, was his comment sarcastic? Maybe it wasn't a comment, maybe it was sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Matt, I think it might have been. One of the coolest things I ever did was, I don't know, if you've, have you ever seen the film Police Academy? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I've seen it. It's a really old school film, but the guy called Michael Winslow, who is like a sound effects guy, and, like, I mean, maybe you're too young for this to be impressive, but for someone like me, Police Academy was like such a classic film. And I got to do a whole um, performance on stage with him doing all the sound effects for me, oh, right. which is very, very cool. That's cool. um, yeah, it's very, very cool. Um, I was going to say, how... how... I, think, I, 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 I've sung with um, uh, a song, an improv song with Tim Minchin playing the piano. That was pretty cool. Okay, nice. Mm. As you do. Yeah, I guess so. Was that just in like the London station? Just like, you know, you know those pianos <laughs> on the side. Do you know, all, all these things happen at the Edinburgh Fringe. Really? And I don't know if you've been to the Edinburgh Fringe, uh, but... It's it's the most amazing place. You get to do the craziest things. Well, it's something we I think I've ever mentioned to you before about going to Edinburgh Fringe. I think we I said about going to it because I'd like to go. To, I met with my dad actually. I spoke to someone about going to it. I'd love to go to Edinburgh Fringe. It's something I'd like to do. What's the like? What's the like the craziest thing that's happened at the Edinburgh Fringe? <laughs> what? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you one thing that happened to me the last in the fringe. So they've got a uh, a show called. Um, Spank, which happens in the underbelly, and they have this thing that you have all the acts, and then just before the final act, they have this thing called the naked promo, where they get a person from the audience who's they can either be in a show or not, and they come on stage, and if they get naked fully, they can pro- they can promote their show. Now, so the last Edinburgh we did it, they did it. It was the final show. It was the final spank of the show, and so I was I was the the end comedian. I was going on like the the final bit. So before we did the naked promo, but they said because it's the final one, we want to try and break the record for the amount of naked people we get on this stage. So every single member of the bar staff, all the security and stuff, they got thirty six naked people on stage. <laughs> And these were all like students and just mad people all jumping out of their head. And it's like a big cave, but also there's like rafters. So they played like um, Mr. Brightside by the Killers. And there were people climbing upside down on beams, doing cartwheels, kissing <laughs> each other. 36 people on this stage just going mad. What? Well, the audience were all just dancing around and stuff. <laughs> and they went, okay, and now it's the end. Here's your comedian, Tom Horton. <laughs> <laughs> Follow that, mate. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, sounds amazing. Like, I, I, honestly, that's just surreal. Like, you can't yeah. picture like, like, so many yeah. naked, like 36 naked people on stage and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. we're pretty much like, sort of come to the end really like it's been like an hour I, think, I think one thing we need to say is you are living in the, the Tower of London I think it's yeah. one thing we need to cover yeah it's covered on TikTok a lot so yeah I'm about to say you cover more. it a lot don't like the TikTok and stuff like that uh, yeah yeah it's been it's been a it's been a real pleasure we're, uh, living in the Tower of London do, very, you, very nice. do you still live there now obviously not right now but like do you still live is that your res- house of residency 
Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's, a, there's about 120 people who live in this town. All right. It's like a little little mini village. Okay. And um, I mean, I've been living there for. Um, I actually, I, I moved out at what just at, at one point, but then COVID hit, and m- my entire livelihood got taken away because I couldn't perform. So I came back with my tail between my legs, going, "Can I stay a bit longer, please?" Mm. But um, now that it's all uh, kicking up, I've got, I've got quite, a, I've got quite a big thing uh, coming out next month. Okay. Um, it's a pro, a program. I'm afraid I'm not allowed to tell you about. No, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, and then I'm going to stay in town while I do all the promo and stuff for that, and then I will move out and I'll, I'll live in a shed. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say that like, anywhere you live now is never going to hit the heights of living oh, in the man. Tower of London. Apart from London, the is rehab- it? rehabilitation centre, apart that, yeah. from may- maybe the rehabilitation centre. That maybe might be that, the yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've got real nightmares of um, in like ten years' time explaining to my son how me, me and his granddad used to live in a palace in the middle of London, yeah. and now we just live in a one bedroom, <laughs> and his mum's left me. <laughs> 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 And we're eating potato smileys because I've spent all the inheritance. And off he goes with peanut butter sandwiches out of the house. The <laughs> <laughs> sandwich, yeah. <it> <laughs> what's what's a really quite maybe a strange question, Tom? What's it like having an intimate moment in the Tower of London? Because I can't imagine that's something that many people can say they've done. Um, it's the Tower of London. <laughs> you know what, what? Do you ever get like? Because obviously you say you have to you have to hide from tourists and stuff. Do you ever ever get like crossed when you come across like that? Are you, are you trying to suggest what's it like bringing a girl back to the town? No, like, no, not, a, not, not I, I can imagine it's a tourist attraction, really, isn't it, Tom? <laughs> I, know, I know there's a lot of torture in dungeons and straps and chains and stuff. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how dark you want to get with this. Um, I am. Um, do you know what the, 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 the longest answer is? Like with, with them using me as a chat up line, most of the time, girls on a night out wouldn't even believe me if I told them. No. Because they, um, and I don't know if you know a lot about the. I mean, getting a girl to come back. I don't know if you know a lot about the history of the town of London, but women don't tend to fare very well around. <laughs> they don't tend to come back out. <laughs> Quite choppy, choppy. Yeah. Here's yeah. one I made <laughs> earlier. <laughs> But also, I couldn't possibly tell you uh, anything too kinky about what happens in the town. Right? <laughs> there's, no, no, no. There's, there's, there's certain secrets that shall remain within yeah. the walls. <laughs> <laughs> Rightfully so. No, I mean, it's, I, I, I mean yeah, no, I just can't, you can't actually imagine it. Instead, we no, just live in our student house, you know. I know, you're, say, you're in our student kitchen. Well, I mean, summer. Tom, you've got, when is your tour then coming? When is your tour? It's in March, isn't it? I think it is. Like your actual tour. It's the whole... It's the whole of March, yeah. I mean, thank you for knowing that. I mean, if you, if you knew about everything about my life apart from when my tour was happening, that'd be really, really <laughs> scary. <laughs> um, uh, it's happening for the, throughout the whole of March, yes. What? And, is- um, I'm not sure where the nearest place to Sheffield is, but... Um, Leeds, probably. I think it's Leeds. Leeds. Yeah, Leeds, 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 Leeds show, yeah. Are you performing in Leeds? Leeds, I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm afraid. I'm afraid Leeds is sold out already. Oh. Oh, yeah. But we might be having an extra day. Okay. Oh, oh, nice. wow. That'd be okay. good. We'll have to have a look be at sure that. Be sure to come along then. Yeah. Can we, are tickets still available for other places? Can people still go online? Where can they buy them? Let the people know. Uh, yeah, if you just go on my, my, my social media is at Honourable Tom, mm-hmm. then um, all the stuff's on there. Um, yeah. yeah, please follow me. That'd be lovely. Yeah, it's fine, yeah. Head over there, make sure you check all that out because, Tom, you've been a pleasure and thank you for coming Fantastic. on the podcast. Thank you. It's, uh, it's been a great episode. Appreciate your time. Really thank you, really appreciate it. your time. Um, we hope you have a good uh, show no, tonight as well. Thank you very much. Any time, boys. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll pop in and say hi to you guys another time soon. That was lovely. Oh, cheers, thanks, Tom. Guys, Tom, yeah, best thank of luck you. and I hope you don't, you know, don't you have a death on the stage today as well. I hope <laughs> today's deathless. <laughs> 
perfect. I'll try not to. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, go check out all Tom's things. The link will be in the description. I'll put it all down there in the top line so you can just easily access them it. So you can find the social media and stuff and you can find it. Make sure you like, subscribe to us, um, and we'll hopefully be back. We are back. We're back next week. We are back ne with another episode next week. Same time. Sun are we doing Sundays now? We don't really know. Yeah, it's Sundays. Sundays, Sundays, six pm. It's so sure ending a Y. I it's ending a Y. Sometime it's it'll be out sometime. Thank you all for watching and <coughs> goodbye.